finding a deep sense of belonging, what we can learn from American Indians, and why number one best-selling author Sebastian Younger wants you to live in a tribe. All right, all right, all right. Hey ho, let's go. Hello, my legendary friends. This is Christopher Lockhead, your host here on Legends and Losers. And man, am I ever stoked you are with us. We have a show today. We have a show today with a man who uh, I believe is an American treasure. And, um, and we talk about um, an incredibly fascinating set of insights he has uh, based on his new book, Tribe. Now, if you're a longtime listener to Legends and Losers, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's so great to have you. I also want to thank you for uh, sharing the shit out of the show. We know that our growth uh, depends on you, and um, I don't know how you've been doing it, but you've been doing it, so continue to share the show. I appreciate you uh, telling people about it and uh, all the other cool stuff you do. Um, and if you're new to Legends and Losers, uh, here's what you should do. Uh, we aspire to have authentic dialogues, real conversations with amazing people about what it takes to design a legendary business and a legendary life. And um, the reason the show is called Legends and Losers is we try to get underneath the real shit. That is to say, uh, we all learn more from losing than we do from winning. And yet very few people talk about that. So we try to get underneath um, what it really takes and have authentic conversations because I don't know about you. But I feel like we are, um, sometimes it feels like we're surrounded and drowning in a sea of inauthentic business bullshit and political bullshit and all kinds of other bullshit. And so um, uh, Legends and Losers is the place where bullshit goes to die. <laughs> all right. I, I want to thank right off the top my buddy, Andrew Carpenter. Andrew and I met last year. He's a technology executive. He lives in San Francisco. Uh, and he and I, other than uh, a passion for startups and tech, which we both share, we also uh, love boxing and martial arts. And Andrew's a boxer. And, um, and he's the guy that turned me on to uh, and ultimately introduced me to uh, Sebastian because uh, he got to know him through boxing. And so, Andrew, thank you so much for making this connection happen. Now, before we get to Sebastian, um, I don't know how you've been feeling. You know, it's a new year. I've been, and I've been, um, I've been feeling pretty good. Uh, although I got, I don't know, I've had this damn ear infection. Um, uh, surfers get this thing called surfer's ear. And uh, so I got this gunk in my left ear uh, from surfing. And I've had to stay out of the water while I'm trying to clear it. But other than that, life is great. <laughs> and if that's all I got, then man, am I grateful. And so I've been feeling good about the new year and how things are going in general. And I just recently heard this song, you know how sometimes Pandora can play exactly the right song at exactly the right time. And so the other day, uh, the, the Pandora machine played the song by a guy named Daryl Dodd. And uh, I didn't know Daryl until I heard this song, but man, I love it. And the song is called uh, Things Are Fixin' to Get Real Good. <laughs> now, I don't know about you. Um, I grew up in a part of the world, Montreal, Canada, where the word fixin' is just not a word you hear that much. And uh, I think it's awesome. Anyway, uh, this song sort of sums up a lot of how I've been feeling so far this year and wanted to share a few of the lyrics with you. So, quote, Lord knows I've done a lot of things wrong, but I wrote them all down in my country songs. Sometimes you've got to go to hell and back just to know where you're at. Things are fixin' to get real good in them honky-tonks, I know. I'm understood. I've been to the school of hard knocks and hard wood, and things are fixing to get real good. Thanks for that one, Daryl. All right, Sebastian Younger. Um, you probably know him best from The Perfect Storm. He's the author of that book, and ultimately, of course, uh, the movie came from it. And uh, if you haven't read the book and checked out the movie, uh, I would highly urge you to do so. Uh, he's also the best selling author of uh, War fire and a death in belmont he's a documentary filmmaker an award-winning journalist he's a regular contributor to vanity fair and abc news and very coolly he um, is the founder of this uh, nonprofit called risk r-i-s-c and it's an acronym it stands for reporters instructed in saving colleagues and um, as a wartime journalist one of the things that sebastian realized is that often Journalists are faced with uh, extraordinary situations, and if they don't know how to conduct themselves, um, they don't know how to take care of each other, uh, bad things can happen. And so RISK is, quote, dedicated to promoting the safety of freelance journalists working in conflict zones. And I would encourage you to check them out at RISK, R-I-S-C, training.org. 
Org. Sebastian has received both a National Magazine Award and a Peabody Award, and here he is, Sebastian Younger on Legends and Losers. So what, what part of the world are you in right now, Sebastian? Uh, Manhattan. The jungles of Manhattan. Yes. And, right. and are you up to anything particularly fun there? Uh, I'm building some um, shelves. Uh, uh, we, my wife and I just had a, a baby, 11, month, 11 months old now. So I'm, I'm building the kind of things you build when you have a child. <laughs> now, are you, do you, are you like going to Ikea to get stuff or <laughs> what do you, what kind of no, stuff? No, I go to the lumber store and buy plywood. And I'm, 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 I mean, I know how to build stuff. So, or I've learned, I've learned how to build stuff at least well enough that it doesn't fall down and it holds what I want it to hold. So, uh, no, I don't, I don't go to Ikea. Yeah, I, I was being facetious. I, I can't quite imagine oh. you <laughs> going, to, going to Ikea. <laughs> well, I, 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 I resort to lots of convenient things. Ikea just isn't one of them. <laughs> and so uh, what's it like for you to have a baby at this stage of your life? I, you know, it's, I, I love it. It's, it's, um, I think it would have been tough to be a good parent 20 years ago. And, and now, I'm, you know, I'm not doing all that foreign reporting and stuff. Um, it really doesn't interest me anymore. And so it's, I'm in a much better place in my life to be a good dad. And I would guess you tell me, do you have a little more time in your life at this stage of the game than you might have as a younger man? I mean, it's, it seems like, like everyone else that, I, you know, like where the, all, where's all the time go? It just it evaporates. Um, I'm not traveling. So in, in that sense, yeah, but, um, you know, days are still pretty busy and I got a lot. A lot that I think about, a lot that I do. So it's uh, you, you train one kind of one kind of task for another, I guess, as you get older. Yeah. Now, um, I, I got to tell you, I, as, as I mentioned over email, you know, I think your book Tribe is an incredibly important book. And you know, I'm curious as somebody who's written stuff as well. What I've noticed is uh, after your book comes out and you, you do your book tour and you talk about it and give speeches and, and so forth and so on, there are sort of new thinking and new ideas or expanded ideas that come to light uh, after you've uh, is sort of pushed send on the, on the publishing button. So I'm curious, what kinds of things have you been learning or maybe expanding upon in the time since, uh, since Tribe came out? Not that much, actually. Um, I, the anthropology was pretty much set when I wrote the book. There haven't, haven't been much, uh, hasn't been much development in that arena. Um, there is a anthropologist who's doing a, um, survey of PTSD in small scale hunter gatherer societies. And he hasn't finished his research and I'm dying to get my hands on it because it, it's exactly what I would have gone to when I was writing my book. Uh, but it didn't exist yet. So that I'm very excited about, but I you know, otherwise it, um, mostly I've been getting reactions, um, on Facebook, actually. I don't, I don't use Facebook, but I have an account so that people who don't know me can, can contact me if they need to, you know, soldiers and the mothers of soldiers and whoever. Uh, and I've gotten a lot of comments from people about how these ideas of community completely changed, um, how they understood their own struggles. And then they realized that basically their reactions to modern society are entirely painful, but healthy, uh, particularly soldiers coming back from war, um, that their discomfort in this society, they understand it's actually a healthy reaction to a society that's not particularly human. And that has sort of completely changed the conversation for them. And I, I just got dozens, hmm. scores of, of messages like that. It was incredibly gratifying. And so are uh, returning vets or vets who are back already and, and experiencing PTSD, are they, are they re-architecting their life around some of the learnings in Tribe? Or, you know, could you, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, so, yeah, I mean, you know, and lots of these people don't have PTSD, right? They're just, they were in a, you know, most of the military, 90% of the military is not involved in combat and really not being exposed to trauma. But they come back to this country and, um, you know, and even people exposed to trauma, you know, most of them really, really should be recovering from it within weeks or months or certainly years. And uh, so the problem really seems to be transition from a close, close 
knit community, which of course any platoon is, even if you're not getting shot at, you could be in a rear base fixing air in a aircraft and, and you're still in this very, very tight community. The the problem is the transition from going from that to going to modern society where there are no cohesive units like that. And um that that kind of cohesive unit is the human norm. I mean it has been the human norm for a million years. So so when you exposed to that and then or taken back out of it, it is extremely traumatic. It's just not PTSD. And um, so, so I think what some people are doing is understanding that the, the, the problem is not their experience overseas, that in a lot of, a lot of that experience was actually very healthy. The problem is how do you construct a life in modern society that involves close community? It's, it's almost structurally impossible to do. When people drive 50 miles to go to work, you know, when they all have, you know, two car garages and they push the button and drive into their garage and then go into their kitchen and then don't, you know, like stay in their single family home and don't relate to the other people in their street. I mean, when society is structured like that, we are going to be lonely. Suicidal rates will be high. Depression rates will be high. PTSD rates will be high. That's just a fact of the society we've built. So the, the solution um, really is, I, I hate to say it, kind of a reordering of society. I don't, I don't know how we would do that. But the way it has helped people is it's made them understand that their reaction to the life, the, the lives back home that they're living is a healthy reaction. And it's not something wrong with them. It's they're reacting in a healthy way to something that's basically wrong with society, at least in historical terms. So I really do want to get to the learnings that you uncovered in the book about, you know, what is quote unquote uh, wrong with society. And I just wanted to share a little something with you in, on the front end of that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm 49 years old, Sebastian. And uh, I live in this town called Santa Cruz, California. Yep. And the experience that I have here is a profound experience of home, of connected, of, of belonging. And the strange, which is wonderful, and I've, you know, I've only come to this in the last handful of years, um, and, and the, the strangest thing of all is Santa Cruz is my home in a way, the place where I was born and grew up, which is Montreal, Canada, which is a wonderful place. But I never had that experience of home. I never had that experience of what you call tribe or connectedness growing up. And, and I have it now. And um, it's, it sounds kind of corny or maybe too, I don't know, West Coasty or something to say, but there is a profound change in one's life when you go from just being another brick in the wall, so to speak, in a, in a, in a, in a large sea of people to feeling like you're part of a community. There's an ethos in that community. Uh, there, there's a connectedness. In Santa Cruz, people say hello and good morning and they smile at each other. And in general, we don't honk at each other uh, and, and things along those lines. And so I got to ask you, you know, I, I've felt this in my own life. What, what is it in your work that has uncovered why this feeling of connectedness to a group of people, why is that so important to human beings? Well, you know, humans are social primates. Um, obviously, as I ascribe to the theory of evolution. Um, we diverged from chimpanzees. The last common ancestor with chimpanzees was six million years ago. And we spent most of that six million years uh, surviving in a pretty challenging environment in groups of 30, 40, 50 individuals, uh, also the typical size of a troop of chimpanzee troop. Um, we are wired to um, respond positively to groups that size, to feel a level of commitment, um, to take our sense of safety from being in a group that size. Uh, we respond positively because that's that's been our um, our, our experience as a species for, for literally millions of years. Humans do not survive alone in nature. They die. You die if you do not have a, a group of people around you where collaboratively, collectively, you are engaged in the task of survival. And that, that, is, that is our human past. And um, so there, what happens in modern society is that we're wealthy and safe enough that people actually don't need a group in order to survive anymore. I grew up in a wealthy suburb. You know, we weren't out hunting with bows and arrows for our food, right? We weren't collectively defending against 
predators or a rival tribe, right? We, 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 we all lived our own single family lives and maybe nodded to the guy across the street when we shoveled out to get the newspaper. That's about it. It's a wonderful liberation from the tyranny of the, I mean, sort of in quotes, the tyranny of the group. Uh, I mean, belonging to a group entails a lot of obligations and, and, and stresses. It's a wonderful liberation from that. But what you lose is a very ancient human sense of security. My security comes from those around me. The problem with the modern American suburb is that there is no one around you in any, uh, in any traditional human sense. So a town like Santa Cruz, I don't, you know, I passed through, I don't really know it. Um, I think there are, there are um, communities in this country that are sort of scaled correctly where uh, it's not too small, it's not too big. People do have a sense of affiliation with each other, a shared commitment to the common good, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and that is that is very helpful. And you're very lucky to live in one of those communities, but a lot of people don't. Um, I live in New York City. Um, I live in a mostly Dominican neighborhood uh, in a, in a five-story building. Most of the people in my little building are related to each other. They're, you know, I mean, there's like, you know, several families that inhabit this building. And, and so there is, you know, along with the, you know, with the loud music and whatever else, there's also a wonderful sense of, oh, wow, everyone knows each other. We are a little, a little tribe, even though I'm not Dominican, but I've been here long enough. So are they so adopting that, that you? That is what in, humans are looking for. Well, are they adopting yeah. you as an honorary Dominican? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's sort of too formal a process. But the, I mean, you know, certainly if the meter maid is going to, you know, come in to pick up the cars, you know, we'll get a you know, frantic knock on the door. Hey, 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 the meter maid's come. You know, I mean, you're just that kind of looking right. out for one another. When we were hit with Hurricane Sandy, uh, uh, the I wasn't in the building yet, but um, there was an incredible kind of collective defense of the building, which included someone, you know, people taking turns standing guard at the, you know, the front door with a machete to make sure that the building wasn't looted. So, you know, like it, 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 it felt, it feels old school and old school feels good. Yeah. I, the last time I was in New York, I had this amazing juxtaposition of experiences. You know, I've spent a lot of time there over the years and I was there uh, doing some business, doing some promotion um, for, for uh, my book. And um, one of my co-authors, Kevin Maney, lives in Harlem. And so I was there for a few days before I uh, saw Kevin. And um, it had been a little bit since I was there. And living in Santa Cruz, I had this bizarre experience because I'd walk down the street, I would make eye contact with someone, and I would naturally smile or even say hello or good morning, you know, and they would look at me like they wanted to, you know, tear out my liver. And I even noticed it with, with cops. Like here, if you see a cop or a fire, you know, fighter, it's, it's not uncommon to wave or flash a peace sign if you're driving or something along those lines. Anyway, I can remember saying good morning to a police officer and again, he kind of looked at me like he wanted to punch me in the face. And then when I went to go visit Kevin and his wife in Harlem, you know, I got out of my lift in Harlem in front of their house. And literally from the, the, the getting out of the car in front of their uh, apartment, uh, there were some folks hanging out outside. And I got out of the car and I can't remember exactly what they said, but, you know, there was a greeting and, and there was a conversation that happened. Anyway, we spent some time together at their place and we went out to dinner in the neighborhood, you know, four or five blocks from where they live in Harlem. And I, you know, it had been some time since I'd been to Harlem, so I kind of forgot. But as we're walking, you know, it was a nice day and so forth. People were out and people were sitting on the steps in front of the, their places and, and things along those lines. And, and there was hello and there was banter and there was talk about the weather or whatever it was, you know. And I just, I had this incredible juxtaposition of experiences from, from one right. New York to another. And it really underscored um, the power of what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's a big, it's a big, crazy city. And there's a lot of gaze avoidance in the city because there are a certain number of pretty crazy people here. And you definitely do not want to get your, their attention, you know. So uh, it, uh, because there's millions of people jammed into a small spot, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of behavior that gives uh, unconscious behavior that where people sort of give each other space. And, um, but then, you know, when, once you get into real communities and I, I have to, you know, I've lived in more affluent neighborhoods and I've lived in low income neighborhoods. And I know you got to say like the more low income, the neighborhood, the more familial and interactive people seem to be. 
uh, along with whatever the stresses come with that, there does seem to be a sort of like social fabric, which is stronger than, you know, in, in, you know, whatever in the Upper East Side, where people are, again, wealthy enough not to, not to have to engage with each other. Well, and, and this is where your book was like a giant uh, kick in the balls to my psyche and awakening, if you will. Um, and you tell me if I'm synthesizing it right. You sort of you sort of touched on it a little bit briefly ago. It seems to me we live in in a world in this Western uh, world where our our belief about what a successful life is is you go out in the world and you you achieve some uh, amount of recognition uh, and you achieve some amount of money and sort of the more successful you are in general, to your point, the more disconnected we become. And I remember when I was living in Silicon Valley, I'm reading your book and I'm going, holy shit, this is my life. You know, I lived in a very nice house up on the hill with very few neighbors, the vast majority of whom we politely never really even made yeah. eye contact, or if we did, it was enough to say hello, but it was a, a, a very much a context of good fences make good neighbors. And, and so, you know, I lived in this beautiful town in Silicon Valley, completely isolated. And, and that was, you know, 12, 15, 12, well, more than 12 years ago now. But, and my life today has completely changed to, uh, and I feel like I'm much more in an interconnected group of people who see each other all the time. And I, I went through, I think the experiences you're describing. And so I, this leads to a question, which is in your book, you talk about ancient Indian societies as compared to the, the if you will, the ancient uh, uh, European based societies and the architecture thereof, why is it we as a culture, we as a society seem to have gotten the fundamental design of the way we live so backwards to what actually makes us happy? Well, I mean, you know, it comes down to the question of what's the point of life. If the point of life is to be as happy as possible. Uh, and if your, um, your measurements for that are, you know, basic indicators of mental health, and we were way off course, right? Um, but maybe that's not the point of life. You know, maybe the point of life is to create societies that are capable of curing cancer, that are capable of having, having people walk on the moon, they're capable of understanding the origins of the universe. I mean, do you have a society which is, uh, which is capable of that kind of technological innovation and that kind of industriousness, um, which is capable of producing a mass society uh, if you if you live in a world like that, there is definitely there's a downside in terms of mental health, but there's also these these incredible outcomes, you know, of philosophy and law and and learning and music and all this stuff. So I I don't know what the point of life is, right? If it's being happy, we're going about it totally wrong. But we are an amazing society. We've done things. I mean, you know, we have figured out to within you know what the millionth of a second or something what the origin of the universe is 13 billion years ago. That's insane, right? So, you know, I, I, there's an upside and a downside to everything. And I think what one of the things this society has to do as a sort of compassionate, concerned world that, you know, we have to figure out how to enjoy the, the, the benefits of this incredible society we have while understanding the costs and trying to mitigate them. Uh, we, it's possible to walk on the moon and, 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 not have like the American suburb be the cultural ideal of where we all want to live. The suburbs do not make people happy. Happy, in fact, I would I would argue they make them desperate. Um, so there are some paradigms that we can change um, and retain the benefits, but we have to have a deliberate conversation about it. It's not going to just happen um, accidentally. And a lot of this is driven by capitalism, and I'm not anti-capitalist at all. It's brought a lot of good things to the society, but. When you have an economy which is based on production and consumption, um, that also is inherently sort of alienating and, um, and, 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 and disconcerting, I think, to the individual. Yeah, and you went where I hoped you'd go, which is, okay, so why can't we have both, <laughs> right? Um, the, the innovation and the pr progression forward and, and so forth, and yet – we live in a, a world in the United States where 70% of us are fat or obese or maybe more. Yeah. And obviously I don't have to tell you about the opioid crisis and how unhappy people yeah. are and how, how many people are on all these horrible happy drugs and you know, all of it. Right. It's just when you, 
when I look at us, I just go like, what, what, what are we doing here? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think people slip into addictive behaviors because they're unhappy. And I think a lot of people are unhappy because they leave individual, lead individualized lives that are unplugged from any rich sense of community that makes them feel needed and valued on a daily basis. So I, I'm not surprised by all that. Um, I think ultimately the solution is for for people to understand the drawbacks of this society and and start fixing them. And, you know, I think there's things you can do. I mean, I'm never going to live in a suburb. I mean, people are free to if they want, but I'm not doing it. And I think more and more people are sort of understanding how um, dehumanizing particularly affluent suburbs are. Um, but, you know, also I think there's a sort of ethos of public service that would be enormously help, helpful. Um, uh, you know, I think mandatory national service with a, a military option would be great. I, I'm not talking about the wartime draft. I'm talking about like everyone between 18 and 24 has to put in 18 months or whatever working for, for this great country. And that sort of, I mean, not only will that mix the people of different race and income and belief and all that, which would be frankly pretty healthy right now, uh, but it would also give each individual person a sense of contributing to the whole. And that sense of being a contributor to the common good is incredibly important to people's sense of their identity and their their sort of personal self worth. Well, and it's interesting that you mentioned that because uh, you know I spent a lot of time in Israel over the years, and um, of course, there's mandatory mi- mandatory military service for everybody, right? Right. And of, and it's a right. smaller country, so maybe it's easier to create quote unquote a sense of tribe in a in a smaller population. But that said, and uh, and you'll have to forgive me, but I think you even mentioned it in the book, do you not? Do you not talk about Israel in the book? Yeah, yeah, I absolutely. You did. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah they, I mean, Israeli psychologists will point to the PTSD rate of the Israeli military, which is 1% as opposed to 20% in our military, and say one of the reasons is uh, mandatory, mandatory service, uh, that people feel like they're part of a whole, and whatever struggles, you know, whatever tough things they've gone through, it's for a community. And um, this country is not feeling like a community right now. Well, if I remember correctly, one of the other things you say in the book is when Israelis come back from their service, the simple fact that everybody else understands what they went through at whatever, at some yeah. level, because they all went through their version of it. There's a, there's, there's not only a shared ethos around uh, the protection and the development of the country, but there is a literal shared experience that every young person has. So even if you had something horrible happen to you during that service, when you come back into that society at some level, virtually everybody can understand and, and empathize. Is, yeah. is, is that yeah, not that's right? There is no military civilian gap. That's right. And so you think we in the United States would be more of a we if we had some kind of shared uh, service along those lines? Yeah, I mean, psychologists will tell you that people um, – they value things more when they make sacrifices for them, which is one of the reasons people value their children so much, frankly. Um, and uh, and what's interesting about this country, it is a great country in, in so many ways, you know, but what's interesting about it is that it actually does not require anything. It doesn't require any input from, um, from individuals other than you pay your taxes. You know what? You don't even really have to pay your taxes. You know, you can put stuff offshore or the end of the day, you can go to prison. You can not pay your taxes and go to prison and become a ward of the state. So, like, it actually doesn't demand a sacrifice. It doesn't demand any contribution from anyone for everything that you get in return for being a citizen. I think that's a mistake in a lot of a lot of different levels. And can you imagine a time where uh, the United States had a mandated year or two or three of some kind of public service, be it military or otherwise? Uh, I think it would be wonderful. I mean, I I, I feel. I, I wish I, you know, I feel bad that I'm that I'm too old to be part of that if it ever happens. But I think it would be a very good thing for people. And I, I got to say, when I was, you know, right out of college or whatever, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. Like I was pretty lost. It would have been great to have been shoved into like some program where I was way outside my comfort level. I was doing something I didn't anticipate, but it was for the country. You know, like that, it, it would have made me very proud in, in some ways, even if I'd gone, <laughs> gone kicking and screaming the whole way. You know, it, it ultimately would have been an extremely good thing for me personally, I think for a lot of people. So do you think we're too self-absorbed? Is that, is that what's going on? Um, 
I mean, we're self-absorbed because our society gives us the room to be. No one's self-absorbed when there's an earthquake or a flood or a war or a forest fire or what have you. Like, they, you know, that stops. You know, the blitz in London, like, that stuff stops. And, the, you know, the problem with a wealthy, safe, affluent society is that stakes are never life and death. And so people can indulge in their sort of self-absorption, which is probably also adaptive. Like, oh, everything's good. There's plenty of food. There's no enemy. There's no nothing. I will concentrate on myself. Like, that's a, I'm sure in evolutionary terms, that's a, that's a healthy adaptive reaction to having safety, sort of safety around you and food in the larder. Um, the problem is that in our society, that's never balanced out by the opposite. Uh, so we have to, we would have to create that artificially to create that communal interaction that is, um, for most of human history, has been necessitated by hardship and danger. And so if I'm somebody who wants to take, if you will, the learnings of tribe and implement them in my life, um, you know, if you sort of believe the, the, that classic, I think, I think it was a Gandhi quote, didn't he say, be the change you want to see in the world? I think he did. I think yes. he did. Anyway, it gets, he took it gets, all the good quotes. It gets, it gets attributed to him. It's like the uh, um, uh, Yogi Berra thing where he says, uh, I, I didn't say half of 90% of what they said I said or something. Funny <laughs> 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 quote about that. But if you sort of believe it, regardless of who said it, that it, be right. the person, be the change you want to see in the world. If I say, hey, you know, I am disconnected from my world. I do live in this fucking box called my house and then my car that I drive to a box called my office and I sit in that fucking box and do it all over, et cetera. Et cetera. So I want to break out of that. What are your thoughts? I mean, how, how have you broken out of that? I mean, I, you know, I, 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 did not li- I don't live in a suburb. I grew up in one. I don't live in one. I live in a you know, low rent part of New York where I, I'm, uh, you, know, you know, a five-store walk-up where I can... I, encounter people all the time every day and uh so i you know if you're locked into your mortgage and living your life with your family and you know i, I mean i'm not saying you should sell your house and move to the country or whatever or to the inner city you're like i you know i i don't know i mean these, these are structural problems with society and you know you can't fit the whole country in my little neighborhood even you know if, even if they wanted to come like i mean there were a lot of people and we built a society that's sort of designed around the idea of privacy and um, and independence, and um, there are costs. There are costs to that. So, but what I okay, but what I would say is, given the structural reality of this country, um, if you can engage with your neighbors in a, in, a, in some kind of substantive way, just try to do it. You know, uh, I talked to a guy where there was a murder in his neighborhood, and he spent the next year. Uh, spending the night, having dinner and spending the night with all of his neighbors in their homes, you know, at their, with their permission, obviously, to get to the build out. That was his reaction to the murder. Um, and so, there were, you know, be, be imaginative about it. And, and in the workplace as well. I mean, that's sort of the new version of a tribe. It doesn't include your family, obviously, but still, it's a pretty intense community. And there's, you know, there are ways to interact in the workplace that are healthy in ways that are unhealthy. And I, um, it's all you know, sort of dependent on how cool your boss is. But, uh, you know, there's way, there are ways to make changes. Buy, buy your boss my book and maybe he'll feel the <laughs> Buy the CEO your book. Yeah. Yes, um, exactly. And the other thing, you know, when it, when, it, when it works, it's incredibly powerful. I was talking to a dear friend of mine about this um, recently. And, uh, you know, there were, th- there were two companies that I was associated with when I was, you know, doing that stuff um, that, uh, sort of develop powerful, powerful cultures. And while both those companies aren't around anymore, we were remarking at how uh, powerful the networks remain. You know, one of the companies went away in 2001 and the other one went away in 2006. And even the one that went away in 2001, you know, and LinkedIn and these sorts of things help, right? This is where the technology, I think, can make a difference for this kind of feeling, I think, that you're talking about. Because I still feel a, a, a sense of, to use the term, tribe with people who are at Scient, with people who are at Mercury. And I've talked to enough of them that they feel the same way about others. And, and, and so that, there is an interesting dynamic that can, that can create that if we're at work, I guess, if you get the right culture. Right. Um, yeah, and I, I give a lot of sort of corporate, I could do a lot of talk 
at um, speeches at sort of corporate uh, events, and I get brought in to sort of talk about how you can use some of these ideas in the corporate world. And you know, there's a few, you know, there's a few pretty simple rules. I mean, like first of all, leadership should experience uh, negative consequences first before the people they lead. Like if you make business, if you're as you're the CEO and you make a business decision that doesn't go very well, uh, you want to be the first person to take a pay cut, not the last person. Um, well, and I, I hate to interrupt of, you, but you know this government shutdown, right? And I don't want to have a political discussion, but I hold them all accountable. And and my wife said something fascinating to me about this. She's like, "All right, well, this is really simple. Why isn't there a rule that says?" if you assholes can't keep the government up and running, because that's job number one is to, is to keep the trains yeah. running on time, right? Yeah. So if you assholes yeah. can't keep the train running on time, great. Every uh, member of Congress forfeits a year's salary. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's right. Well, and this, this yeah, doesn't happen, right? Does yeah. anybody think for one second the government shuts down if those assholes don't get yeah. paid? Yeah. Yeah, or strip them of their health care or whatever. Like, has some, exactly, some, consequence. some kind yeah. of a consequence. Yeah. And or community service. I mean, wouldn't you like to see all those people out in the, in the, in the city parks with rooms? Fuck yeah, I would. Put and, them in a, a yellow kind of, outfit. As a kind of penance for not, for not taking care of us. Yeah, that would be great. Well, and I think this is true of our corporate leaders uh, as, as well. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I can't believe that, you know, by way of example, Volkswagen or Wells Fargo or any of these companies that committed ongoing yeah. fraud yeah. for years, knowingly and lied. I mean, there's no question about how evil some of these companies are. And yet there's no there's no there's no ramification yeah. whatsoever. I, I know. I know it's 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 really shocking. I write about that in my book, Tribe. Like, I mean, no no tribe would would allow itself to be damaged the way this country was in '08. Uh, I mean, I mean, those you know, a relative handful of people, mostly white dudes, frankly, uh, cost this nation fourteen trillion dollars. Think about that, fourteen trillion dollars, and not one of them was even charged. Right. I mean, and, and, you, and you could not do that to a small group of the equivalent harm to a small group of hunter gatherers without them cutting your throat, you know, like or kicking you out. Like they would insane. fuck they would fuck you up if you did that. Right. I mean, in your book, one of the things I love about how you describe it is if we're a small tribe of people, 50, 60, 100 people living together, the power of the interconnectedness is such that if one or two of us is misbehaving in a, in a way, you tell me if I got this wrong, that is out of a, alignment, if you will. I don't know. You tell me, what, what's the language? The, the tribe sort of takes care of business, right? Yeah. I mean, a coalition, I mean, listen, the coalition of any three guys can overwhelm any one guy, no matter how big the guy is. So that means that these sort of alpha male types um, really cannot get away with too much bullying because they'll encounter resistance. And one of the universal um, applications of capital punishment in tribal societies is where the community defends itself against essentially a bully, like essentially an alpha male that is taking more than his share of food, of women, and what have you. And um, that that gets the death penalty pretty quickly. There's and a great yet, anthropologist named Christopher Bohm, B-O-E-H, I think it is, who wrote, who's written about that. It's one of the sort of uh, the prehistoric origins of morality and um, in which circumstances do tribal peoples kill their leaders and this when their leaders are abusive. And, you know, there's some, there's a story out now about um, the wealth on planet earth and how much of it continues to go to the top 1%. And, and you talk about that in your book that one of the things from a societal structure point of view is uh, there in, in tribes that work, there is not this massive uh, difference between quote unquote the leaders of the tribe and, and 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 everyone else. Yeah, I mean, you know, our human origins are small, highly mobile groups of hunter gatherers of thirty, forty, fifty people. There's no way to accumulate wealth because you just can't carry it. I mean, there's no money, right? I mean, there's no. I mean, it's just. I mean, the the, the business of everyone is survival uh, and procreation and raising the young for the next generation, and that's. That's an extremely egalitarian system. Um, you know, once you get agriculture 10,000 years ago, people are staying in place and then they can accumulate capital. And once you can do that, you get inequality and you, you get 
uh, some forms of tyranny because, of course, if you're invested in an irrigation system in your plot of land, it's, you can't just pick up and go whenever someone acts abusively. And so all of a sudden, farmers are invested in their land and, and, and can be um, and, and can be abused by, by leadership. Yeah, I'm just looking at this. Uh, this is on USA Today. Uh, according to Oxfam, 82% of the global wealth generated last year went to 1% of the world's population. Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, that's, I mean I, it's not, that's, that is not consistent with most of our evolutionary past. I'll put it that way. And so do you have some thoughts, Sebastian, on if on one hand, you know, I believe in capitalism. I believe deeply in entrepreneurship. I think when an entrepreneur rises up, uh, not only does she uh, lift herself up, but often she takes a community or a category with her and that can make a giant difference. So how do we live in a world that feels increasingly winner take all, where we do want to have the incentives for individuals to start companies and build things and grow or do important research that could make a giant difference, et cetera, where there's, where there's real reward associated with those things, because I, I believe that makes a giant difference. Yet at the same time, deal with the fact that, you know, very few of us get to play in that game. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm not an economist and, and you're really asking an economic question. I, I'm guessing that if, um, you know, 80% of the world's wealth went to the top 20% of the world, I'm, I am in, I'm guessing that that's still enough incentive for people to be entrepreneurs and innovators and work hard and all that. I, you know, it, it, you know, at some point, if you're, if you're, if your efforts, your hard efforts, don't produce a disproportionate, disproportionate return, you're just not going to make the effort. I mean, that, that, that's that's what happened with communism, right? Um, uh, so there's, I'm sure there's a sweet spot. There's a sweet number there uh, where X percentage of the resources go to X percentage of the population that sort of maximizes the incentive and maximize the distribution of wealth. And I, I am not an economist. I don't know what it is, but it's definitely not 1%. But that's not what, that's not what we're yeah. talking about. The, the other thing I wonder about is, you know, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, or if you think about the development of the human psyche, the human ego, et cetera, I, I sort of thought that if you were, were a person, well, I'll just talk about how I feel. I'm a person who's been very lucky. I'm a person who has gone from being in the, you know, the lowest 10 or 20% economically to being in the top 1% in, in, in less than a lifetime, clearly. And so I think we live in a part of the world where it's miraculous to me that that's possible. I mean, I had no education, no money, no experience, no nothing. I threw out a shingle and, you know, the rest is history, like so many other immigrants and entrepreneurs. And, and yet, for some reason, we now live in a culture, particularly in the United States, where, uh, you know, entrepreneurship is at an all-time low. And so, why is it that, you know, we live in a, a culture where supposedly you can, you can pursue happiness and, you know, the old cliche, if I did it, anyone could do it. And yet, culturally, structurally, uh, we, we, are, we are crushing that entrepreneurial spirit. I, again, that's an economic question. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer. Um, I, I think the this, this society is set up for people to pursue um, wealth, uh, affluence. I think that's the sort of paradigm that we're offered. Um, but we know from this, from mental health statistics, that as affluence goes up. Um, it brings with it certain risks of depression and suicide and PTSD and such and things like that. So one thing that maybe we need is a, a non, a non monetary value out there, right? Like that, that there is actually a value placed in human connection in service towards the common good like that. that and because those things make people very, very content, very happy. Like you, you, they've done studies with this. Like you walk down the street and give someone five dollars, the person who gives the five dollars experiences a greater rise in oxytocin, which is a kind of feel-good chemical, neuro, neurotransmitter. It, uh, the person who gives the money experiences a better, more good feeling than the person who receives it. It's like pretty commonly known, right? So, so what? So how do we create a value in society where 
acting on behalf of the community is also something that we that we promote, that we identify and promote and encourage and venerate, along with money, which and money is great. I mean, listen, I, you know, I've got no capitalism. You know, it's associated with human rights laws and all kinds of good things in the world. You know, it's the non-capitalist countries uh, that really struggle with those things. Uh, so I, I'm all for capitalism, but, you know, it has to be balanced, basically. It's interesting. I find myself when I talk to younger people and they say, I don't know what to do with, you know, with my life, with myself. And I find my reaction more and more is, well, go for a walk and make a difference and see what happens. Like, yeah. Go out in the world yeah. and fucking make a difference in something and see what happens. You know, and well, it's interesting when, when people, ahead, um, yeah, uh, when people join the Peace Corps and spend a couple of years in a small village, typically a small village in a um, developing country, they come back to America and, and around a quarter of them sink into a pretty significant depression, which is exactly the same percentage of veterans who struggle with depression when they come back. Um, and so, you know, what they've had experience in is being part of a community. That's what humans want to do. Like, that's what our brains are wired for. Um, and when you come back to this country, there is no community to participate in. And so people get depressed. And so, what? yeah, what I would say to that young person is, you know, do something overseas. Go Or not even overseas, just go, go out of your environment and in, insert yourself in a human community and make yourself necessary to it for a little while and see how you feel and then decide what you want to do with your life. And, and the thing about that I find interesting uh, is there are big things you could do, like join the Peace Corps, or if you had a lot of money, donate a lot of money or, you know, whatever it is, or donate a lot of time if you didn't have money. You know, so a big thing you could dedicate yourself to your religion or whatever it is. Right. Um, but there's also, you know, teeny ones um, living where we live, you know, shit grows here like crazy. And my wife, Carrie, grew up on a, on a small working farm in San Jose. And so, uh, and of, of all her father's girls, uh, she got it, you know, m more than the others. That is to say, she, you know, loves to garden and so forth and so on. Anyway, long story longer, Sebastian. Right now, we have lemon and lime trees that are going mental. And, and there's no way we can consume them all. So, you know what she did? Right. Yesterday? Right. She took a couple of uh, pails, essentially. And she put them at the end of our driveway, one with lime, one with lemons. And she put a sign, lemons and limes free. And, you know, they right. disappeared. And some of them disappeared while we weren't around. And some of them, you know, people saw us. We were outside. It was a nice day. And, they, and, and all of a sudden, all these interactions start happening with, yeah. you know, neighbors right. that you know, neighbors that you don't know. And so I guess my point is, she's really taught me how a simple thing like giving away some lemons and limes yeah. creates exactly what you're describing. Yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing psychologists would say that you guys derive more psychological benefit from than the people that got the free lemons and limes. Yeah. It, it, isn't that so fascinating? I, I, yeah. I find myself, I started to do it over the holidays um, years ago, and now I just find myself doing it randomly. Like I'll go get a coffee somewhere and they'll have a tip jar and you put a 20 in that tip jar and right. yeah. man, uh, shit changes for you and for them, right? Yeah, that's right. No, it's, it, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there are small ways to do this. It's too bad we're relegated to the small ways because human society used to do it in one big way. And, you know, life wasn't easy back then, but, but in human terms, people really did not struggle with suicide, depression, and that sort of thing in small scale hunter-gatherer societies. And it's just isn't, isn't really a problem that people had for the most part. And you, you write a bunch about that in, tri in Tribe. Would you mind unpacking um, some of that research and then maybe some of your thinking about, about this topic? Yeah, well, I, you know, I did, I did a lot of research anthropological research about mental health in, in small-scale hunter-gatherer societies, which, of course, typify our evolutionary past. Um, I had the idea because a lot of the soldiers that, that I was with in Afghanistan admitted that they didn't want to go home to America. I mean, they, you know, they wanted to go home and have a party because they were sick of being stuck on an outpost. Um, but after a couple months in Italy, where they were based, before they came back to the United States, they admitted that they wanted to go many of them go back to Afghanistan. So it got me thinking about, like, what is it that they're missing? Community. Yeah, they're missing, they were, you know, they were missing each other. And, um, 
it made me think of my uncle Ellis, who's an adopted uncle, um, and he was half Lakota Sioux, half Apache, and he made the observation when I was a young man that um, that uh, throughout the history of this country along the frontier, that it, this is the way he phrased it, white people were always running off to join the Indians, but the Indians were never running off to join the white people. And it made, when I got to know these soldiers and saw their reluctance at coming back to the United States, I, I had this thought, like, why does no one want to go in the direction of modernity, in the direction of, like, civil, quote, civilization? Like, what is going on? And um, so that, that's what gave me the idea of um, sort of researching the sort of epidemic of PTSD uh, as a function of not of trauma in the battlefield, but of um, a transition disorder coming home for people that either were or weren't traumatized. Uh, and so that was the sort of genesis of the idea about tribe. And and I'm curious, and I know it's impossible to sort of put a percentage or to quantify it, or or maybe it is. You tell me of of our vets uh, who who experience PTSD. Do you have any sense, Sebastian, of how much of it comes from something horrible happened, or something horrible happened to somebody I care deeply about, uh, and and that memory haunts me? as opposed to I had this deep sense of connectedness of tribe of shared mission and mission and vision and, and that bonded us together bonded me very much and I had a sense of purpose in my life and I come back to a culture where none of those things are true do you have any sense of that well first yeah I mean first of all only about 10 percent of the military is engaged in combat uh, and is in a position of being shot at, seeing people killed, killing people. Uh, it's only about 10%. And the PTSD rate in the U.S. military is around 20%. So clearly people are suffering in ways that don't have to do with trauma. Um, so what I would say is that those people who weren't traumatized and yet slip into depression when they come home, they're taking out fraud and what have you, that kind of thing. But I would say that those people, what they're really experiencing is a transition disorder of exactly the same sort that Peace Corps volunteers experience. Um, then you take people who are traumatized. Now, it doesn't make evolutionary sense that trauma should be um, deeply incapacitating to a majority of people for their lifetimes, right? I mean, if that were true, this human race wouldn't exist. We are wired to react to trauma in self-protective ways and then and then pretty quickly return to normal, right? Um, but that, that requires that return, returning to normal for hundreds of thousands of years has happened in the context of a community, a community of other people who also went through a similar trauma that you went through. It's all being done collectively. The problem with the U.S. military is that the trauma is experienced collectively, but the recovery takes place individually because everyone gets shipped home. That is not how what humans are designed for. So. There are these two groups. One of the people that were never traumatized and have a transition disorder when they come home because they're giving up the sort of connection of their platoon. The other are people that were traumatized. They need that, that human connection to recover properly, but they don't get it because they're being returned to the great American suburb or what have you. So, so I, I, all of this, all of this are just people reacting in healthy ways to a societal structure that is new and is not particularly human or particularly healthy, although it has other advantages. Well, and there's some stuff that seems particularly fucked up in our world. So I, I've read a lot of research about um, men and our development. And of course, we know in the United States, the vast majority of mass murders are committed by men. I mean, I don't even know if anybody can remember a woman showing up at some place with an AR-15 and killing a bunch of people. And so I start, you know, I start to wonder about that. And, and so I've read some things that I th think are pretty interesting. So, for example, um, the adult white male is supposedly the most lonely demographic in America. And the average American man does not make one substantive friend after college. Wow. <laughs> That's brutal. Right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and so we are alone, there. aren't we? I mean, uh, not just men, but I mean, in our in our society, we've set ourselves up to to be disconnected. Yeah, I I, I agree. It, it um, uh, it's a it's a real it's a huge problem. Um, and 
But keep in mind, the way our society is set up has also produced enormous good in a lot of different ways. So you, so the, the, you, what we have to figure out is how do we return to a sense of community that sort of works and makes sense in a modern industrial society that's as spread out as we are. Yeah, we're not going to get all the way there, right? We're never, it's never going to feel like we're living in 30 person encampments in the woods. You know, it is not happening. Uh, but we can get even a tenth of the way there. That will already feel quite, quite good. It may tip the balance to return people to functionality. You don't know, this is a bit of a tangent, but you don't off the top of your head remember what it cost um, Craig Ventner to map the human genome in the late 90s? I mean, it was millions and millions and millions. I, 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 I and, don't, anyway, the, the I reason don't I bring it up, Sebastian, is, is to your point on there's a lot of other good shit. There's a flip side to this coin, absolutely, which is yeah. my uh, sister-in-law for Christmas got my wife and I this little box from 23 and me, you know, she paid for us to get our genomes yeah, done. Right. right. And, and by the way, hell will freeze over before I fucking do that. But we can, we can have a conversation about why I don't want to do that. But if you want, but the thing that struck me is, you know, I flashed back to, I, I mean, I remember the genome being mapped very clearly because I, I it just, it was one of those moments in history where I went, holy shit, something big just yeah. happened and shit's going yeah, right, right. to be before and after this shit, right? And, and that really wasn't that long ago. And now for Christmas, your, your sister-in-law for, I don't, I don't know how much 23andMe costs, but it's not that much. It's like, holy shit, that happened fast. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's all accelerating. I mean, um, if you look back, when I was born in 1962, my grandmother was born in 1900, um, and within, you know, within my parents' lifetime, um, people who, uh, Sioux and Cheyenne fighters who, who fought at Little Bighorn, who shot arrows and threw spears at American soldiers, ca- cavalry, uh, in, in, in the United States, um, some of those people lived into the 1950s. Think about that. I mean, almost within my lifetime. Yeah. And they were yeah. shooting bows in there, and they massacred a company of American cavalry in Montana. Like, that's, that's incredible. Well, and there's an interesting uh, emerging theory about um, that topic. Uh, you know, my buddy, Kevin Maney, who, who was one of the co-authors with me on Play Bigger, he's got a new book coming out called Unscaled. And I, I saw him last week, and he gave me one of the, you know, the early galleys. And we were talking about some of the ideas in the book. And one of them was this aha that um, if you sort of think about the, the late 1800s into the 1900s, there's a 20-year period in there roughly where we get you know, electric light and we get the automobile and, and a bunch of other. Right. You know, there's a 15 to 20-year window where it's like mass, shit massively changes. And in the book, he argues that that's what we're in right now, that within you know, 15 oh, yeah. to 20 years from now, yeah particularly as AI and all the new shit hits, the world's going to be completely different. Do, do you yeah, think oh, abs- absolutely. We should have this conversation again in 10 years and see what happened. I'm, I'm yeah, gay if you are. Changing. <laughs> okay. Somebody changing very quickly. And, and, but we're not, you know, as a species, biologically, we're not changing very quickly. It takes thousands of years for evolution to, to uh, make changes in the human body. So it's, it's, uh, uh, we're outstripping ourselves in some good ways and bad ways. I think, um, I, think I have to, I have to jump pretty soon. Uh, um, yeah, I, it's been very, very nice talking to you. It's been great talking with you. And, and the thing I sort of also really wanted to thank you for Sebastian is, you know, the last decade in my life has been a huge decade and um, tribe helped me understand what I was doing without knowing that's what I was doing. Because the reality is, over the last decade, I rejected the life that I had, which was that of an executive, um, not knowing my neighbors and spending 400,000 miles a year on a plane, uh, to not doing that. And I, I lived in Tahoe for a while, and now I live here. And, you know, and, 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 and when I read your book, I was like, oh, I have been constructing tribe. That's what's going on. I have been, you know, my family doesn't live here. I moved here from Canada on the East Coast, as I mentioned. And so there's just a, I think it's just a very powerful thing that you've begun to unpack here, which is, okay, so 
Uh, on one hand, to your point, we want all the innovations of the modern world. And on the other hand, we, we got to remember what it is that truly makes a difference on a day in and day out basis in our lives. And that's having a deep sense of interconnectedness with a, you know, a group of people and some, I don't know, you tell me if this is right, some kind of a shared set of beliefs or ethos. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just remember we're a social species and we, for 6 million years, we've lived in groups of 30 to 50 people typically. Um, that changed just a few thousand years ago and then radically changed a few hundred years ago. So just keep that, yeah, keep that in mind. Uh, if you're, you feel like you're not, if you're not living um, in a healthy way in your life, if your life doesn't feel right, that, that, that could have a lot to do with it. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, can I ask you one other thing before I let you go? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, boxing. What's up with you in boxing? Oh, I, you know, my life changed pretty significantly a few years ago and I uh, decided I needed something to put my head in a different place. And I'd always, I've been a long distance runner since I was a kid. I was a really good, really good distance runner when I was young. I ran a mile, a mile on up. I was a pretty serious competitor. And, um, and I just felt like I needed some really intense athletic endeavor. And uh, it was boxing. I'd always wanted to box. And, and it was it is the hardest thing I've ever done. It's pretty pretty stunning how hard it is. It's crazy how hard it is, right? Yeah. I mean, forget about getting hit. That's the least of it. Just the cardio, the cardiovascular demands on your body when you're sparring. I mean, even if you never got touched, just doing that in, in terms of your cardio output. It's insane. I mean, forget about racing the mile. Like it's three minutes, three minutes in the ring. Like it's a, it's incredible. I mean, I was really shocked. And I'm, I ran a poor 12 mile when I was young. Like I got a good set of pipes there, you know, and it just destroyed me. And uh, so you, you're, you're continuing, I assume. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, it's, a I, great, I it's a great pleasure for me. Yeah, me too. Uh, martial arts in general. And, and it's funny that you yeah. focused on boxing because for the last six to nine months, while I train other things, uh, I've been primarily focused on boxing. There's something great about just it's footwork and it's yeah. handwork and you take all the other yeah. stuff out, right? It's a very beautiful sport. I mean, the grace and elegance of it, along with just the raw power and endurance, it's like, it's very beautiful. It really is. Uh, yeah. so it's, it's an incredible discovery. Awesome. Anything else before we kick out of this one, Sebastian? Uh, no, I, I think I'm good. If you're ever in New York, look me up. I'd be glad to show you around my neighborhood. We're planning on uh, making a trip a little bit later this year, so uh, we would love to come and visit with you. Great. Shoot me a note. We'll do. I'll take Seb you up to my boxing gym. We can go a few rounds. Oh, I would love that. Uh, you've got to promise <laughs> to be a little bit nice to me, but <laughs> or actually, fuck, don't, don't be nice to me at all. <laughs> hey, hey, listen, you're you're ten years younger than I am. I'm, I'm going to be asking. I'm the one who's going to be asking for mercy. So, but it seriously, is, like, yeah, def definitely get in touch. We'll do. We'll do. And uh, you know, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful, uh, a wonderful chance to have a conversation with you, Sebastian. Well, likewise. Thank you. Take care. All right. Be legendary, my friend. Whoo! Wow. You know, I get off some of these and I just, I know I say this a lot, but it's just how I feel. I cannot believe I get to have these conversations with these people. Um, I think, uh, I think Sebastian's an American treasure and, um, you know, really grateful that he would spend the time. And if you know somebody who would love this episode as much as uh, I hope you do, why not share it with them right now? And while you're at it, why not post it on social media <laughs> and share it with billions of people? Um, now, I want to let you know that if you have not read Tribe, your friends here at Legends and Losers are giving away three copies of Sebastian's book. And uh, here's what we'd like you to do. Go to iTunes or wherever you experience Legends and Losers, write us a review, take a screenshot of that review, fire up your email, write Tribe in the subject line, and send us a copy of that uh, review as well as your address. And if you do those things, the first three people who do that will get a free copy of Sebastian's book, Tribe. So write a review, take a screenshot, email legendsandlosers.com, give us your address, uh, or email us blackhole at legendsandlosers.com, give us your address, and the first three people who do that will get a copy of Tribe, and everyone else who does it, well, you'll get my, uh, you'll get my love. <laughs> 
All right. We would like to thank risktraining.org, dedicated to promoting the safety of freelance journalists working in conflict zones. Check us out at R-I-S-C Training. Org. Harper Collins Instant Classic Play Bigger How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. Why not pick up 500 copies today? PursuingResults.com. They produce legendary podcasts. If you want to start podcasting, they do it all for you. Uh, and they even produce this podcast too. Equity Directory. If you're in the startup ecosystem and you want to find the best people, if you want to get, get involved with the hottest startups or you're a startup, want to find some people, this is what you need to do. EquityDirectory.co. A podcast we think is fantastic. If you're a veteran, check out Change Your POV Podcast. There's a wonderful podcast, uh, and it's all about how veterans can take control of their lives uh, after they leave the military. Check out Change Your POV Podcast. OneLifeFullyLived.org. We're the nonprofit helping you dream, plan, and live your best life. Check us out, OneLifeFullyLived.org. Project Relo. Project Relo is a nonprofit that connects executives and entrepreneurs to legendary military veterans in the United States and puts together these awesome leadership experiences where business people can go and do uh, pseudo military operations with America's uh, veterans. So go check it out at Project Relo, R-E-L-O dot org. The smash hit book, another book we love from our friend and guest on Legends and Losers, billionaire Jeff Hoffman. It's a great book. It's called Scale. Our good friends at interviewvalet.com. If you're a thought leader and you want to get your leading thoughts on some podcasts, check out interviewvalet.com. Fathom. If you're in the marketing business, you want to grow revenue, you want to grow your business, check out fathomdelivers.com. Another podcast we love from our friend Jamie J. Stop Riding the Pine. Jamie's an awesome guy, and that's an awesome podcast. Now, if you live in Australia and you want to drive some growth and you want to do some marketing, check out rapidmedia.com.au. That's our, uh, the business founded and run by uh, our dear friend, Von O'Connor, and their leaders in Australia, rapidmedia.com.au. And speaking of uh, marketing outside the U.S., are you in Ireland? If you want to do some legendary marketing in Ireland, check out fusion.ie. That's F-U-Z or Z, depending on your religious beliefs. F-U-Z-I-O-N dot I-E. Legendary PR marketing and graphic design in Ireland. All right. We'd like to remind you that this podcast is a sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network, and we would love you a little bit extra if you shared the shit out of it. All rights do remain disturbed. Uh, we'd ask you to read The Perfect Storm. Keep your hands up and your chin down. Never build a website on Wix. Be nice to your sister. Please tip the wait staff. Uh, don't forget, it's the losing that makes you legendary. Love you, mom and dad. Thank you so much, Candy Dandy. And hey, Colin, this podcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Avi Shea Avrami, CEO of Wix. Sorry, Avi, we just ran out of time for you. I am so glad that you chose to invest part of your life with us today here on Legends and Losers, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.